I would like to invite on stage um, Steve Juritsen, one of the smartest people and investors in the Silicon Valley. Steve was the founding venture capitalist um, in four public companies and several rapidly growing companies um, and leading investments which were um, acquired in the aggregate of $12 billion. He was an early investor in um, Planet, Nirvana, Memphis Meets, Mythic, uh, Synthetic Genomics, Hotmail, D-Wave, and what's more important is Tesla and SpaceX. Steve completed his undergraduate in electrical uh, engineering from Stanford University only in two and a half years, graduating number one in his class. That's amazing. Um, now, in 2016, the President Barack Obama appointed Steve as a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship. Steve, welcome on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, can you hear me OK? Great. Oh, I'm excited to be here with you today. Um, she asked me to speak a bit about what's next. And knowing that the panel that comes right after me is all about AI and machine intelligence, I thought I wouldn't you know, double down and talk about that, nor about crypto, as you just heard from Tim Draper, but instead focus on some interesting areas, a triptych, if you will, of alliterative sectors that are very different from what you might have come to expect me to speak about. Well, maybe the first one you would, Moore's Law and how it's changing everything. But the others, what's going on in agriculture, what's going on in space exploration, the reason I like those is they're very emblematic of much broader trends that are occurring throughout much of the industrial world that hopefully will be relevant to everyone in the room, and yet um, the really profoundly bizarre changes that are going on in these industries. I'd say the automotive sector and aerospace have gone through this change already, partially. Life sciences, agricultural biotech, and a variety of other areas are just, uh, just beginning. Um, but let me actually open with just a brief statement to build off what you just heard. I do believe that machine intelligence, broadly defined, deep learning, machine learning, the broad use of iterative algorithms, more generally, to build things. What do I mean by an iterative algorithm? Like an evolutionary algorithm, generative design, the way Autodesk would talk about it, deep learning, the way you may have heard of it, or anything that relates to a neural network. But more generally, all kinds of areas like this are ripe for revolution in how we do engineering. And if I could make one general statement about what I'm not here to speak about today, I would say that machine intelligence, deep learning in general, is the most profound advance in how we do engineering since the invention of the scientific method itself. Right? The scientific method was a wonderful technique, a process innovation, if you will, for how humanity accumulates wisdom over time, throws out bad ideas, accumulates good ideas, and continually improves. It's, it's almost the vector for progress, if you will, in the economy and in the sciences. That's been a very important invention for how we do engineering you know, versus just you know, whatever cockamamie idea you might have. Right? It's hard to imagine a life before the scientific method. I think in the not too distant future, we'll look back and it'll be hard to imagine a life without machine intelligence, without using iterative algorithms to build things that transcend human understanding, to build things that are more complex than we even know how to build. This, of course, will be the path to what we call you know, general AI. This is radically changing every industry. And so if you're an entrepreneur today and you didn't think about the internet at any point, whatever it is you're doing, or you didn't think about the mobile phone or mobile applications in any way, and you're starting an information business, that would be bizarre, right? Investors and others would look at you as like, really, you're just ignoring the internet? You're ignoring the mobile phone in terms of how your business strategy unfolds? In the not too distant future, we'll look the same way at deep learning and machine learning. So that's just the setup for the panel that comes next. And the entrepreneurs that'll be pitching there, uh, I think are probably forging the future in a very important way. But I'll give you some other examples here. So first a disclaimer. These are the kinds of companies I have the most experience with, where I led their first round of venture investment, sometimes even before they were incorporated, um, joined usually, in almost every case, uh, maybe one or two exceptions, joined the board of directors at the, at the first founding of the firm. And they're in all kinds of different industries, right? I alluded to um, machine intelligence and, and deep learning. That would be like the mythic and the Nirvana uh, examples near the top. But Memphis Meats, which I'll talk about later, very different kind of company, literally changing how we produce meat in this world. The ones, of course, that many of you know as brand names like Tesla and SpaceX are some of the most you know, rewarding experiences of my life to be associated with these companies from early on before they had any product success. Uh, and that's generally true in all these cases that they didn't have product success when we first invested. 
And it is from these entrepreneurs, these amazing people, that I learn what I know. The patterns that I see are because of the great work that they've done. So indirectly, everything I may share with you, if it's interesting, it probably came from them. Uh, and the best I can do is try to aggregate the lessons learned over now 23 years in the venture business. Okay. I have to ask, how many people have seen the 120-year version of Moore's Law, sometimes called Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law? I just want to do a rough hand count if I can. Okay, I'm going to keep them up just so I can do a, uh, I'm going to guess 20% of the room, and then I'm assuming some people are shy, so probably 30% of the room. Um, the reason I, want to, I ask first is that means majority of you have not seen me speak before because I show this slide in every talk I give. I've done that for 20 years now, regardless of topic, because it is the single most important thing I could possibly share with you, um, regardless of subject. Right? We could be talking about the future of work, we could be talking about biotech, we could talk about anything, and this is what I'm about to show you. Is I think the most important thing ever graphed in the history of humanity, it is incredibly powerful to predict where we're going, what's next, what does the future hold. So let me explain what it is briefly for the two-thirds or so of people who haven't seen it. So on the uh, y-axis is the logarithmic scale. Every tick mark is 100x, another 100x, another 100x, right? So a straight line on a graph like this would be an exponential. And what we're plotting is just how much computational power can you buy for a buck, constant dollars over a long period of time. And those 120 years on the x-axis. So there have been a lot of different, these, color, these sort of shaded bands, a lot of different technology epochs, right? We all live in the integrated circuit era, the one on the far right, but it started with mechanical computing and went through the vacuum tube machines. Well, in fact, the relay-based computer that cracked the Nazi Enigma code, if you watch the movie The Imitation Game, um, the vacuum tube computer that predicted Eisenhower's win in 56. Kind of bizarre that one could plot something across all these technology substrates, but in fact, if you plot the best price performance computers of the day, there's this peculiar line that goes for 120 years. It's like, why in the world would that be? Right? We all learned in, when I studied electrical engineering that there was something magical about the semiconductor process. Lithography, miniaturization, faster, better, cheaper, because as you made the chips smaller, they consumed less power and they took less area, so they were less cost. And you had this virtuous cycle that Gordon Moore first observed and everyone assumed is endemic and, and, and sort of intrinsic to the integrated circuit. Something about that technology made compounding progress. Those people for the first 50 years of this curve, first 70 years of this curve, frankly, had no idea they were on a curve. No one had plotted it. No one told them they were on a curve. Yet, humanity's capacity to compute has compounded uninterrupted for 120 years. World War I, World War II, the Great Depression had no impact. Some would argue, um, some economists like uh, out of Santa Fe Institute and elsewhere argue that this is the source of all progress and economic growth in its varied forms, the way it percolates out, and I'll show you a couple examples in a moment, into all kinds of industries that have nothing to do with the computer industry. All right, so there's not just a, so my main point today is this is not a software only thing, a computer only thing. If you're a startup in financial services sector or agriculture for that matter, this curve is gonna have an impact on your life. And the reason is, as you go up and up to the right, something that wasn't simulatable becomes simulatable. In other words, a trial and error experiment of science becomes an information science. A great example for anyone driving up and down Highway 101 here, just a mile or so away, are all these wind tunnels at NASA Ames. Huge wind tunnels that largely never get used anymore. And it was a moment in time when the computational fluid dynamics got good enough that you could model everything you would do in a wind tunnel in a computer. So starting with the Boeing 777, they never used the wind tunnel again for anything. There's no need to, right? If you want to test a new wing lid or curved shape to a plane, you can run a computer simulation more effectively than a scale model wind tunnel experiment would show you. And you can imagine how that changes airplane design. Suddenly, you can do parametric exploration around a design space. You can do thousands of experiments in the course of a day. That changes everything, and the industry never looks back to the old methods. That watershed transition, of course, has happened in computing. Of course, it has happened in telecom and datacom and long ago. And now it's rippling through, for regulatory reasons, more slowly, through life sciences, healthcare, agriculture, and eventually every industry. Okay, my point, oh, I have one last thing, just labeling the points in case, uh, this may be of interest to some people, by the way. Don't listen to Intel on this uh, topic of Moore's Law, even though Gordon Moore is co-founder of Intel. The last seven data points are all NVIDIA, right? The baton keeps handing to a new company. It's not like Intel has any particular grasp on computation, right? Their GPUs are much more, and now the TPUs are much more important to Google than any CPUs they buy. Most computer programming, most code at Google is generated by a computer. These iterative algorithms generate their own code. The practitioners are more like parents than programmers. It's a very different kind of engineering modality. The majority of code is that way, right? 90% by some estimates. And the vast majority of computation is shifting off of a single CPU core into a massively parallel architecture, much like the human cortex. 
So many industries. I've made, I think I've made this point. This is just a reminder over the last 10 years or 15 years roughly what we've been investing in formerly at DFJ and now at Future Ventures, uh, sectors that would not have been on the venture capitalist roadmap in the 90s. So when I started in VC, it was software, semiconductors, and life sciences. And usually life sciences was different firms, different practitioners, so I didn't have anything to do with them. It was just software and semiconductors. That's all VCs did in Silicon Valley. You could invest in automotive. You'd lose all your money. Right? And these were like all provably bad ideas for decades, right? Every attempt failed, right? There wasn't a single automotive success story since Henry Ford until Tesla, right? And we'll get, we'll get to why that might be. And I'll give, you, I'll give a couple examples from these in a moment. But realize this list keeps growing. Um, and whatever industry you might be in, uh, it's going to hit that one too. So robots. I'll just mention briefly, this is a Rodney Brooks, one of my you know, favorite and most inspirational roboticists who early on in his career realized uh, around some uh, movies and such that got popularized under the title Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, um, is that you can take a traditionally crappy industrial business, like robot arms or just tooling in general, if you think about it. Putting some motors and gears on a metal arm doesn't command much of a price premium or high gross margin. It's been generally a bad business sector. But what if it became a software-centric business? What if you took all the components in a cell phone, the six-axis accelerometers that are so darn cheap that allow you to know exactly where you're pointing your phone, Put them on every joint of the robot arm so you have a sensory cortex, you have a sensory feedback loop, and basically use really cheap springs, really cheap motors, make the whole product as cheap as it can be, the physical thing, and move all the value into the software and services stack, just like it is in the phone. I think you could think of this as the metaphor of what every physical good is going to go through. The car of the future is going to be an AI stack, and, and you know, the, the thing is the minimal vessel for code and services. Similarly for the robot. The next robot you would buy from them or anyone else is going to be a software upgrade, not a hardware upgrade. Just like you don't expect your next phone to look any different from your current phone. You might love it. It might be awesome. It's all going to be software and services enhancements. And then, of course, the steady March and Moore's Law in the underlying processors and memory. We take that for granted, of course, that doubling each year. This, I bought the first of their products. It was the same cost in current dollars as an Apple II computer. I mean, it's like that kind of cheap breakthrough in robotics where things before were more like a mainframe. That jump from like mainframe-like cost, you know, bulk, cumbersome programming models to, oh, it's just like a cell phone is a theme I'm gonna re return to time and time again. My other favorite robots, this my car parked out there and another one from Google, their earlier version of their autonomous vehicle test fleet. I've taken many rides in those vehicles, the autonomous ones, that is, and you get a peek into the inevitable future. That's something I might also want to say in general, that the investments I most adore are where an entrepreneur has a mission, a vision, a dream of a future that is unquestionably the future. It is inevitable that all cars will be electric. It is inevitable that they will all be autonomous. In fact, all vehicles will be autonomous and electric. They will not have internal combustion engines. That cannot persist for 500 years. Right? Just look out far enough in the future and you, the debate is over. Now it's a real interesting debate how we get from here to there, how relevant it is in a five-year time frame, but in a 500-year time frame, it's an inevitable tr transition. Once you know that and you can chain back to the present and think of a series of business steps that get you from here to there, that's the tough part, you can find some of the most amazing investment opportunities on the planet. And I think the whole transition of the automotive industry is one of those. Aerospace is another. I'll, come, I'll, go, I'll do a little more justice to that in a moment. But what I would say is that these products are software-centric products. There's several million lines of code. And when asked, what will make Tesla competitive 10 years from now, 20 years from now, Elon says it's all about the software. Of course it is. It's not going to be a better component, a better V12 engine equivalent, if you will. There isn't any sustainable differentiation in certainly any patents. They've made them all open source. Or a proprietary component supply. Right? The whole idea behind Tesla, SpaceX, and the most interesting companies like Planet, which I'll get to in a moment, is commercial off-the-shelf hardware, all the values in the software and services layer, and you, in a sense, benefit from the, um, if you will, in a sense, the peace dividend of the cell phone wars. When you know, Apple versus everyone else on the planet beats up their suppliers and all the components that go in these things to get them as cheap as possible, you can reconstitute those parts into very interesting products. I'll give you an example in a moment. Actually, I'll just mention the autonomous car thing. One last thing, another company that we've been involved with. The way you would expect, I think, autonomous cars to come to market is not just car ownership the way we're used to, where that might transition to a rental or Airbnb-like model for your car, but a, a totally independent driving services. And there are a number of companies uh, I was scrambling to come out with these. You'll, you can see a, a Waymo car downstairs, a Zooks vehicle here, just the design idea. Um, but the idea here is vehicles that will never be owned or driven by people, no steering wheel on board. And imagine an Uber or Lyft-like service that just is dramatically safer, cheaper, more available and can radically change 
Even things like urban design, where like a third to, in the case of LA, 40% of all land is for parking. It's just ridiculous. Why have all that parking if you have a truly cloud-like service of driving? Um, and you, you get, I mean, people in the Bay Area or elsewhere that are well penetrated with Lyft or Uber can, can see that inevitable future. It's just so much easier not to have to deal with, uh, with parking, which in some cases is like the majority of time spent in the urban environment is spent looking for parking. Now, another example of an industry transitioning is what Planet's done with satellites. So I mentioned the cell phone taking the components, right? What these guys realize, these co-founders of Planet, is that if you take the components of a cell phone and just fly them in space, it, and they did this at NASA as a stunt. They flew three cell phones called Alexander, Graham, and Bell in space to show they work just fine in the vacuum of space. Kind of interesting to see that, you know, just no problem. You know, every part of the camera uh, of, of the phone worked in space. Um, and, but here's the important part, it had more memory and more processing power than any other satellite in orbit. And you might ask yourself, how can that be? The government spends billions of dollars for some of those big birds out there. They're the size of a Greyhound bus. They are kind of like a mainframe computer and cost as much and they are as archaic. Because once you get into the design mentality of it's an expensive billion dollar satellite, I want it to stay up for 10, 20 years, it better be reliable and better use proven hardware, space hardened, flown before, componentry, oh. stuff like this, by definition, you're locking in, first off, the thing sits up there for 10 years, and you're using 10-year-old technology. You, I mean, anything that's waiting 10 years and you double every year, that's a 1,000x hit you take just for using 10-year-old technology. And that's the problem with Moore's Law. You can't use the old stuff that the military industrial complex might try to feed you. You have to use the latest commercial off-the-shelf parts. And you get a 1,000x advantage not for even being smart. For example, the Curiosity rover, if any of you watched that incredible thing, you know, when that landed on Mars with the sky crane and all that, and an incredible feat of engineering on all fronts. True. The camera on board that we delivered there is a two megapixel camera because it was a 2004 design freeze, locking in everything on the memory pipeline, mem and the entire electronic stack locked in around a two megapixel camera, which is the best you could have gotten in 2004. You can imagine how much better it gets today. So Planet realized, wait, make satellites the same way we do our cell phones, use those literally those same components, fly hundreds of them, and uh, by the way, they're about a thousand times cheaper, arguably quite a bit more than a thousand times cheaper. So you get these flock of them. The benefit here is fly a swarm of satellites close to Earth, and as any photographer knows, there's two ways to take a good photo of something. You either get a really expensive telephoto lens that's heavy, I mean like heavy glass for any of you that have you know, played with the big SLR cameras, to take a picture at a distance, or you just get a small, really lightweight, inexpensive lens and get very close to your subject, right? Just getting closer to whatever you want to take a photo of improves it, right? And that's what Planet realized. Fly these things really close to Earth, they'll fall out of orbit every year, we just keep putting more up, and they raster scan the whole planet. It's like a line graph of the planet. As the planet rotates, they're going around the North and South Pole. What do they do? They image every meter, this just started this year, uh, imaging every meter of Earth every day, every part of Earth. So you can um, catch, uh, illegal fishing and illegal deforestation as it happens. You can monitor all kinds of things in economic activity, like counting every car in every parking lot every day, counting every tree on Earth every day, just where are trees, how many do we have? Right? Software developers can write all kinds of things because you get all the tsunami of data, and data. now you do machine learning algorithms, of course, on it, and visions, um, computer vision systems to say, like, find me things that look like this. So let's say new housing starts. Let's count all new housing starts globally every day. Let's count every new road, or detect every new road for mapping software, even if it's not documented, which happens a lot in India and China. Just new roads pop up all the time. And uh, they're just not even on maps. All of this potential was heretofore unavailable because you had to point a satellite at something. Every other satellite company has like eyes on Afghanistan or eyes on Kuwait. You have gotta pick one when you're flying over because you have to literally move the satellite every time you wanna take a new photo. These guys always point straight down and raster scan everything, load it all up to the cloud and let people just browse and find things. So journalists love it. It's got a whole suite of new possibilities. Maybe many of your businesses could benefit from it. This global image of the planet being able to manage it better. Just to give you a sense of the kinds of images they can get, um, they also bought Google satellite business and one in Europe. This is a uh, off Nader angle looking at um, Qatar and the Pearl development there on the offshore. It's just, it's just incredible. It looks like SimCity. It's hard to imagine these photos are taken from space. Um, or on the left from Patagonia on the right to Shanghai. Um, incredible detail and incredible perspective you can have on the planet. I think by seeing the planet better, uh, we can manage it better as well. So. Transition to one of the other areas. So in general, what I've tried to share so far is, you know, the cell phone technology is being reconstituted to all kinds of stuff. I mean, satellites, robots, cars, you name it. You can dramatically change the cost of a product, moving the software area. Transitioning for just a moment to life sciences, 
There's a guy, Carlson, who's also a venture investor, and he's just been plotting for a number of years the cost to do a whole genome sequence. So you have dollars on that y-axis. Again, logarithmic scale, right? So a straight line, exponential declining cost. Um, it's pretty dramatic what's going on here. This is largely driven by Moore's law. By the way, this is a derivative of Moore's law because to do the shotgun assembly analysis, you need a lot of computational resources to basically stitch together. Think of it this way. Imagine someone gave um, all the books in a library, ripped all the pages into maybe partial sentence fragments, flipped some of them around 180, and just handed it to somebody to scan in and figure out what, what book is what. And oh, by the way, you have maybe like 100 or uh, between 30 and 100 copies of every book. So you have in all your random shredding, you have partial overlaps all over the place, and you have no idea what went where. Computationally, figuring out how to do that was Craig Venner's big advance to realize that's the way to do whole genome sequencing. It pushes most of the burden to the computational layer, and that's part of the reason you see this cost coming down so dramatically. Now, to the point where you get, sequ I've been sequenced twice for free, just on various promotional gambits or what have you, um, and in the not too distant future, you get sequenced when you're sick, when you're not sick, cancer cells versus non-cancer cells for whole uh, pan genome. Again, deep learning analyses of what correlates with health and disease. So what are some places where this gets applied? You'd think, of course, human health, um, pharmaceuticals, um, perhaps generating, as we do at Synthetic Genomics, um, you know, better proteins, better uh, omega-3 rich oils, you know, the components of food in pharmaceuticals, uh, as well as vaccines and all that. that. That's being done. But I want to share what I think is one of the more interesting ones that'll touch trillion dollar markets, and that's how we make meat. And this is just the, the goofy Moose law because it starts with an M, and if you're going to talk about more and more, it sounds like it, it belongs. Um, but there's no real reason to call it Moose law, other than all of meat production will radically change. This is another one of those inevitabilities where I know my future self, mm -hmm, maybe within 10 years, but certainly within 50 years, will look back at my present self and condemn my current practices as immoral as it comes to meat. I don't want to know what happens in a slaughterhouse. I will not visit one. I'm, I'm eating meat every meal. <laughs> uh, it's full disclosure. Um, I know that when I have an alternative where no animals are harmed, even if it was more expensive, I would choose that, right? If it was in reasonable, if it's less expensive, I will then for the first time question how we make food. I, by very crude analogy, it might be like slave owners in early America refusing to see the slave ships when they landed, just not wanting to confront the reality of the horrors of slavery and what it was like coming across from Africa. Instead, they sort of put that aside, and only the few people who did led a lot of the emancipation movement that followed, the people who actually opened their eyes to the, to the horrors of that system. I think animal rights, sentient beings and such, one day we will <laughs> certainly embrace them uh, just like we will hope our future AIs embrace us you know, in their pantheon of, uh, of sentient beings. So what's wrong with meat production today? It's not just animal welfare. That, that was sort of an aside of sort of my, my clarity of where we're heading. The part that makes it really compelling is how inefficient it is today. About a third of all usable land on Earth goes to meat production, right? The crops to feed the, feed the animals and the animals themselves. The, it only says 18% of greenhouse gases, but it's close to, close to the majority of methane production, which is the worst of the greenhouse gases in a sort of 20 to 25 year time frame, but arguably 40 to 80x worse than CO2. And it just absorbs, I mean, everything, water, land, feed. When you build a whole cow to eat a steak, that's not efficient. Now imagine you could do it a better way. Oh wait, one last thing before we transition to the better way. Uh, how big is the market? It's huge. Interesting that Earth, um, on Earth, uh, the United States is about a third of meat consumption. What happened is in the 80s and leading up to that, when you had this rapid growth of the middle class in America, meat consumption skyrocketed. And this happens globally. Whenever you have a lower class going to middle class, they rapidly increase meat consumption. And what happened in the United States is we imported it from Central America. We called it American-grade beef. So Burger King, McDonald's, what have you, sold American-grade beef, which actually meant Central and South America, which is the primary, and to this day, from the 80s to today, the primary cause of deforestation in the Amazon basin. So grow cows and flash, flash and burn market, um, agriculture. China is about to do that to Africa. because China's going through a similar rapid growth in the middle class. Meat consumption is skyrocketing. The more Kentucky fried chickens in China than the United States. They're going to have the same diabetes and health problems we do. That's all coming. But in the meantime, the supply chain is out of control. And not to mention, when you concentrate the animals in, you have risk of mad cow disease, avian flu. It, it's just not a good way to grow a piece of meat. All right? Imagine you could do a better way. Now, for what's a better way? So Memphis Meats is the one, full disclosure, that I invested in and led the Series A. Um, and we're joined by Bill Gates and Richard Branson. And interestingly, the two largest meat buyers in America, Cargill and Tyson. Imagine you're a big meat buyer. You know, you have farmers that make the meat, but you are the one that buy it. 
package it, sell it, you know, through your various channels. The idea of a supply chain disruption from something like a black swan event like mad cow or avian flu is really scary, right? You'd much rather have diversified supply, ideally one that's totally clean, there's no possibility of these things happening, right? Because there's no animal involved. So um, this company grows meat. How do they do it? They take stem cells from, you name the species, cow, duck, I've tasted the duck most recently, um, but it works for any piece of meat. Um, they grow the stem cells, immortalize them, then they differentiate them into skeletal muscle by growing them on a uh, collagen um, aerogel. So it's much like our arm differentiated from stem cells earlier in our development. They become multinucleated cells just like our arm. If, if you put a pacemaker on it, it would become cardiac muscle. If you don't, it becomes skeletal muscle. The thing you grow is muscle. It's not a plant substitute. It's the same thing. It tastes exactly the same. So that is good from a consumer adoption point of view. If you can convince people this is a better way to make it, we think it'll be uh, definitely halal uh, compliant because it's the most um, humane way to treat the animals, which is very important for getting halal status in the, in the Muslim world. So uh, I think it um, is the inevitable future. Whether this company leads it, I think they are currently leading it. I believe that's the, the future. And when it does, think about how that changes the global economy, right? Just like the autonomous vehicles are going to have a big impact on the fact that, by the way, 20% of people who have a job today drive something for a living. 20% of global employment is driving. That's going to go through a profound change. Agriculture used to be 98% of US employment. Now it's less than 2%. And that's going to go through a profound change. The ability to move it closer to points of consumption, to have urban farming uh, and indoor farming that is more efficient than the outdoor has all kinds of side benefits on just shipping stuff around, the freshness, the uh, availability, what have you. It'll taste better. It'll be healthier. And by the way, in the long run, you can engineer things like, let's make all of the steaks, right, have omega-3 rich oils instead of unhealthy oils. That could be easily done. You can even do turducken, right? You could have blends, just like a wine blender can make a better tasting wine by blending. You can imagine making better tasting meats than we've ever had by blending. And at scale, if you think the long term, how could it possibly be more expensive, right? If you just grow the thing you eat, you should roughly have a 10x advantage across the board on water, energy, land, and raw materials used to feed it. Okay. Let me switch to one last topic and then wrap up. So I mentioned Moore's Law, basically computational transformation of our industry, move just generally life sciences. We haven't even begun to see how that's going to change human health and agriculture. And now, when I say space, I think this is a good placeholder for a whole set of industries that haven't seen a new entrant in decades. And what happens when they do? It's very fascinating, because this is one where it's, I think it's played out the most, where you had the fewer number of companies to look at and the analytics of what just happened are pretty profound and pretty stark. So what do you have? You have an immigrant from South Africa, Elon Musk, comes to the US, takes on all kinds of regulated industries, banking, commercial banking, automotive sector, here with uh, what some would call the military industrial complex. Pause for a moment and imagine doing that yourself. Imagine saying, you know, Russia, they're kind of inefficient in the way they launch rockets. I'll just go over there, start a rocket company and somehow get through the political process and the better product should win, right? I mean, like the, the fact that that worked is mind boggling, right? And a testament to how much better this product really is. Um, so these are some photos in the middle that I took when the Falcon Heavy launched and on the side, some others that other people took. And it is profoundly inspirational to hear the sonic booms as these things come back to realize this engineering feat worked the first time, uh, which I'll come back to. Kind of amazing, a testament to the simulation tools that they have primarily. Um, and the modular reuse. In a sense, the way um, Elon looks at SpaceX and Tesla is the way a software engineer would look at a problem. Decompose it into modular systems that you can reuse and build in safety and reliability through modular reuse. So test one engine in the Falcon 1, put nine of them on the Falcon 9. Launch the Falcon 9, put three of those together, the Falcon Heavy. It, it's so much better than building a new engine each time, right? And uh, they can achieve amazing things. Let me show you how dramatic the shift the market share was. So here we have from 1980 to the present day, market share of commercial launch. If you're a satellite company and you want to launch satellites, you can play the world market typically. For, so this is the non-military stuff. So you have an open, generally open market, some arguably um, um, ITAR related uh, friction between sectors. But over the long term, especially in the early days before there was ITAR uh, restricting Chinese launch from US uh, operators, you had a pretty interesting story here on the blue bottom bars. 100% market share to start going to zero, right? For a three year period. I uh, have a little, right? Then SpaceX entered the market. Almost all of these are SpaceX launches. There are only a couple that are other companies. A single entrant has radically changed the landscape for a space launch. Now, how can this be, right? And 
I guess the, the, well, I'll say something in a moment on the next slide, but at this point, all I want to say is it was dramatic, and the competitive response of the incumbents is to give up. Literally. So the Chinese ministers, Europeans, and others have said, we don't believe the prices that SpaceX lists on their website. Even if we had all their technology, whatever that technology is, right? It's, there are no, pa no patents at SpaceX, by the way. Whatever, if we had all that magical technology, we couldn't compete. And in the case of some US companies, their answer, literally the incumbent says, we need several billion dollars of additional money so we can try to make something. Like we have nothing in our product pipeline that competes with us. Like, can you imagine like Larry Ellison at Oracle having that response to a new entrant? Be like, oh man, the new entrant's better. We give up, right? Like that's unheard of in technology, right? You just lie if you're Larry Ellison. You just say, oh, of course we've got that cloud thing covered. We're, we're all over it. You know, we've been cloud from day one. You know, you just make stuff up. Like Steve Jobs and, and Larry Ellison did, right? He's famous for that, right? To just admit publicly, I can't compete is unbelievable. And that is something the aerospace industry has gone through. The automotive sector is a little bit in denial, but they're going to also realize, oh my god, we have to totally start over and change our entire talent pool to software types of talent and like, restructure everything in our industry. And they, they're in a little bit of denial on that. But the competitive response is, as you can see, to stumble. Think of all the industries where that's about to happen. So a bit more that's amazing about SpaceX, this reusing of the booster, right? It worked the first time. No, not many people know that, unless you really watch, I mean, it was publicly disclosed, this is not new information, but only people who were watching this closely realized the first time there was no boat, it was just came down over the ocean and hovered and then dropped, but there were no photos. There wasn't that like proof point. There was just the data, which every engineer at SpaceX saw that says, my God, it worked the first time, right? All we gotta do now is hone the accuracy of where it lands, but it comes to a stop. This idea of a supersonic, I mean, the idea of sending a rocket up, turning around, coming back, turning around again, landing, on its legs, that's the way they should be, right? And that's the way rockets should fly. But like, that sounds hard. And every competitor of SpaceX said it would never work. Then once it worked, they said, oh, it's not economic. Uh -huh. Yes, under the covers, the cost of refurbishing these rockets must be so high that it's not economic. Why do they say that? Because if it is, they're screwed, right? Like, what are you going to do if you're an airline and you throw your plane away after every one-way flight? And then a new entrant comes and says, I got reusable airlines. Like, I fly my plane more than once. That's game over, right? I mean, th that wins. That's a dominant market strategy. And so the power of the Nile is very strong in this one. Um, and so, what, as some of you might know, this with BFR and future generations will allow super, uh, well, more supersonic flight, orbital flight around where you can get from like here to China in 20 minutes um, at a cost that's lower than coach airfare, right? It's like the, the economics are like, the rockets don't need to be expensive. In that mind-blowing future, uh, you would never get to unless you dreamed big. And this is what I'll end with, because I realize time is up. Dreaming big. These are some photos from around 10 years ago, uh, some of which I took, some of which uh, I purposely included the old version of the dream from Mars. The photo in the bottom center still sits at the entrance, or has always sat at the entrance of SpaceX headquarters, where you walk in the front door on the way to the manufacturing lines. All the employees in California see this, which is their headquarters. It's the prize, it's the goal. And the reason I put this up here is, again, the idea of colonizing Mars is such a bold stroke, it is so different from what any other company was trying to do, that they invested a lot of time and energy, and frankly, a billion dollars, roughly, of R&D dollars, to make the booster reusable, because you had to if you're gonna get back and forth to Mars, right? If you're only lofting satellites for the government into low Earth orbit, why go through all that hassle? It doesn't really make that dramatically better, if you, unless your competitors do it, and they're not doing anything innovative, so let's just all keep business as usual, and that's why you don't see any major change for decades. Last thing, actually, uh, from SpaceX, in case you didn't know it, the next great product from them is the thing they're calling Starlink. It's gonna give broadband data access to everywhere on the planet for a remarkably low cost. So it's gonna take thousands of satellites. They look like the one in the center, the test rig, and a couple that flown already in space. And the idea here is to literally have gigabit down and gigabit up links to anywhere on Earth, right? Airplanes, boats, oil platforms, rural areas where you're trying to get broadband out to the hinterlands and it's too expensive to do it with fiber. The ground station, the big breakthrough is phase array antennas. To make a long story short, if you look at, let's say what OneWeb is saying, which is a competitor in this area, it should cost 200 bucks, maybe 250 bucks, to have the solar cell battery, phase array antenna, ethernet, LTE chipset to light up an entire village, let's say in Africa, 200, 250 bucks. It doesn't matter where they are, just throw it on the roof. You don't have any wires, it's just throw this pizza box on a roof and you have internet. That's going to allow us to go from two to six billion people online much faster than most forecasters would even care to fathom, right? We're going to have this dramatic influx of human talent. Those people are going to have access to online education. They're going to be great um, entrepreneurs. They're going to radically increase the possibility for innovation to occur, right? Tripling the online population means roughly tripling 
the number of people who are connected to the global economy, to the global economy. Right now, those four billion people with no internet connection, they're not really part of the global economy. We don't sell and buy services with them much at all, other than Procter & Gamble and Unilever for like small amounts of money. These people are decoupled. They're gonna come online, that's gonna be a profound change. So I'll leave, I'll leave it with that, but we call, I call it Skynet. Okay, so what have I tried to share? There has been this incredible renaissance of innovation. Every industry is going through these profound changes. They're usually, when someone like a software person looks at rockets or cars, they see opportunity for change. That's the big theme, but it's also all kinds of interdisciplinary advances. It's now reaching into markets that are really big, like food production, human health, what have you. And this idea of Moore's Law, this accelerating technological change that's always changing, I mean, always continuing for like 120 years now, just assume it goes on for another 10 or 20, that's the source of opportunity for the new entrants, for software companies and entrepreneurs, frankly, to make a change. Because think about the opposite. If you don't have change, if you don't have disruption, you have stasis. The big get bigger, nothing changes. Why would a new entrant have a chance? It's, you gotta really count on Moore's Law and things like it for any of the entrepreneurs in the room to have a chance. So I think there'll be more black swans, more financial disruption, more you know, collapse of various markets that just assume that uh, in your financial planning. But it's great to be a new entrant. Also, it's great to be small. Small company, small country, small teams are gonna drive the future. So let me leave it at that and say thank you very much. Thank you, Steve.